Hey guys, welcome to this week's Off The Record. We are with Mr. Steve Sidwell. And uh, thank you for joining us, mate. Um, are you ready to get stuck in with this? Let's go for it, mate. I'm, I'm worried about what you're going to ask me, but I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best to answer. Okay, question number one. Who are you and what do you do? My name is Steve Sidwell. Often confused with a footballer. I'm not the footballer. I'm a musician. <laughs> I'm a composer, arranger, uh, orchestrator, producer... I work uh, for anything from rock and roll artists, bands, through to musicals for West End and Broadway. Amazing. Um, okay, question number two is where did it all begin for you? Like, take us right the way back. Where, where do you remember it starting? Well, I'm a third generation musician, so I grew up in a house full of music. My dad was a saxophone player and he was part of the big band era in England in the... Um, 40s, 50s, I guess, and he, he was an arranger as well. He was a copyist. He played in uh, something like, I think it was 39 West End shows. Wow. And, you know, he was a typical working musician in those days. He, he did sessions when he got them. He did shows. He used to teach. Sometimes after shows, I know in the early days, he used to go on and do nightclubs as well to try and make a living to bring up uh, three boys, all of whom became professional musicians. Uh, my grandmother was a piano teacher. So I grew up listening to jazz mostly and, um, and tried to learn as much as I can. I never made a conscious decision to be a musician. It was just what happened. Wow, that's incredible. And how did you get from, you know, like learning from being younger and moving through to the ranks? Like, what, did you have many clubs you went to? Or how did, how did that start? I think um, I did a legitimate course. So I, I learnt uh, piano from when I was young. I wish I'd taken it more seriously and I wish I was a better piano player. And I learnt the violin as well, which I never really liked. And, and um, I had a bit of an accident which didn't help where I, I managed to chop the end of my finger off, which got sewn back on. Uh, but it always made me feel sick to sort of play a string instrument, which is now, even when I mess around playing the bass of the guitar, I can't. But I'm like pressing down the middle finger of my left hand because where they sew it back on, it's all squidgy and numb and horrible. But mm. that's what happens when you're a kid and you cycle too fast down hills and not looking where you're going. It's so, because um, I, I, I chopped the top of this finger off right. with, a, with a blender, unbelievably. Um, oh. and, uh, and I can't feel it. There's no sensation. In no, the well, mine's like that. Does it make you feel sick if you press on something? Yeah, yeah it makes me feel all queasy. I, can't, I still can't. I, I don't like thinking about it, but. Um, it's not, not so well, it's just the feeling it has, it's strange. But when I was 11, I went to a comprehensive school and uh, they had a very, very good parapetetic uh, brass teacher. It wasn't a particularly great school, although I believe it is quite a good school nowadays, um, called Ashmore in, in North London. But Alan Lumsden was a, was a wonderful musician and trombonist. And he had a very good school brass band. And I wanted to play the French horn, not that that was a brass band instrument, but I always liked the look of it. And um, I think they had a couple at the school, but then they asked who had an instrument. And my great uncle, um, who was in Blackpool, had left my dad, who became a professional saxophone player, a trumpet. So I was told, well, if you've got a trumpet, mate, you've got to play that because other people can't afford an instrument. We've got to give them an instrument. So I thought, okay, fair enough. And um, so I, I took to the trumpet. Um, I guess I was reasonably accident prone because I had quite a bad accident soon after I started playing the trumpet, which was, um, I like to tell people I broke my leg playing football. <laughs> I did, but it was actually running into the road after the football in front of a car. Oh dear. So uh, I, I couldn't walk for a year and um, the result was I used to practice all the time because I didn't have much else to do and I thought, oh, this is all right actually, I quite like this. So I got quite good quite soon and... I guess I was considered a prodigy and I became a professional studio trumpet player. That was my, that was my main thing, which I um, got into the business doing. But I did a, a classical course in my days back in whenever it was. There weren't really jazz courses apart from at Leeds. And um, I lived in London with my parents. I didn't really want to move out. I was very close uh, to my mum and dad. So, so I stayed in London, went to Guildhall, did a classical course. But... All the time, I think one of the main seats of learning was the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. Okay. Which was, in a way, our university. So all the best players, commercial players, brass players, and a lot of the great rhythm section players went there. It was, um, I guess it was part charity, part funded, part privately funded. 
organization it's still going it's a much bigger organization in a different way than it, it was then but so many great players came through that band and i was lucky enough to be part of it and of course back in those days there were loads of uh what we called mecca bands or the americans were called top 40 bands where we'd play at places like hammersmith palais or uh, the empire lister square and and they had bands where you know it probably wasn't the pick of the jobs, but for a young guy, you could get depth in there and then you'd learn by playing with good players. So you'd make your way into the business that way. Um, and then for me, I, I used to get involved with, with rock and roll groups. I was a brass player. I was always interested in, in other aspects of, of art as well and music. So um, musicians could be quite um, single-minded in, in their pursuit of music, which is understandable. I enjoyed art, I enjoyed fashion, I enjoyed pop music and knowing what was going on. So, so I gravitated towards the, the rock and roll side of the industry, which, which held a lot of things together. And it, that's carried me on through life, actually, is, is my love of, of those things. Um, and I've you know, had some very nice involvement in recent years with, with some you know, interesting figures in the art world, etc. So I was always interested in that connection between music. So I, I became involved with rock and roll and then I would do the brass arrangements and the string arrangements and eventually, you know, be doing whole arrangements for TV shows, etc. And, and it carried on from there and through work with artists like Robbie Williams, who ventured across genres in from pop into jazz. I was, a, I guess, a useful ally and, and, and I could bring something to the table and through that, you know, got into musicals through Queen and, and Brian May and We Will Rock You, who were kind of interested in the whole Robbie thing and came to me. So, so um, yeah, it was, it was a natural transgression. I never really made any decisions about, about learning in my career, but I, I always figure the day I don't learn something is the day to pack it in. You know, that's, yeah, that's sure. kind of the great thing about what we do. Right, question number three. Sorry, I went on a bit there, didn't I? No, I mate, go for it. It's great. It's great. Um, question number three is, um, who was your biggest inspiration? Um, am I allowed two? Whatever. It's up to you. So, yeah, I mean, the, the two, my, my dad, Roy said, well, uh, was the biggest. Um, just bringing us up, playing us music, you know, every, you know everything from Charlie Parker to Stan Getz. Lester Young was his favourite player, and, and then of course the big bands, and you know introducing me to things like the Buddy Rich Band, which I went on to play with and tour with, and um, all sorts of great music. He used to take me into theatres. I used to sit in the pit, and I used to sit there watching the musicians, thinking this is amazing. Not not even aware there was anything else going on the stage. That was enough for me. It was it was, <laughs> it was great. So also I think when I was um, about thirteen years old. 13, yeah, I must have been 13 years old. I heard an album, which really was the, the album that did it for me. I was obsessed with it. Something's just fallen off somewhere. I'm sorry about that. Um, it was called Threshold by Patrick Williams. Uh, uh, Pat Williams wrote, I don't know, something like 300 movie scores and countless TV themes and was a ranger to, to stars like Sinatra and Barbra Streisand. And um, he was... He was really my sort of writing hero, and, and um, I'm proud to say I became very close friends with Pat. Unfortunately, he passed away um, about a year and a half ago, and uh, I went out to LA for, for his uh, service and everything, but, but I became friends with him and his family. I actually wrote to him and um, basically told him that. I think I, I managed to get quite drunk. I'm not very good at things like that, and one night I thought, you know what, I should just write to the guy. Uh, <laughs> And I was working in LA quite a lot and at Capitol and, and I used to talk about him and, all, and you know, the eminent engineers there like Al Schmidt and Steve Jenner, who became my friends. Oh, and you know, I said, you should just write to Pat, just phone him. He's a great guy. So I did. And um, I think I wrote to him and said, if I play that album one more time in my house, my kids will never speak to me again and my wife will leave me. But um, it's all, and, I, and it's all your fault. And he actually really liked my email and uh, wrote to me and said, look, when you and I please come up to the house and have lunch. And um, strangely enough, someone had played in some of my work saying, this sounds a bit like you. And he said, yeah, it does. And I said, well, I was ne never meant to rip you off. It was an influence. He said, no, no, not at all. I, I, I get it. I guess we're all influenced by someone. Not that my work would ever um, be anything like as good as his. But yeah, so, so Roy Silver and Patrick Williams. 
that's i think that's incredible that you've had someone that you uh, are inspired by that you've taken through your career but then actually gone on to meet they've heard some of your work but seen a bit of them in that and because that must be nice too for them to have passed on as well you know sure you know his uh, wife and daughter um after they were clearing out his stuff which and, and it's ongoing there's lots of archiving to it but the, the threshold the the album that i love so much they they have gifted me uh, the original score and the pen it was written with Oh. It's an unbelievable honour to have. Obviously, I've got a signed copy of the album here. Um, but uh, I have the original score. I'm a custodian. Um, and it, it goes to a museum um, when I pass. So uh, oh, wow. in, in the meantime, actually, I'm trying to work out the best way of framing it um, and, you know, having it displayed in the house, which would be nice. But yeah, there you go. So I'm the proud uh, custodian of, of that score. That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, question number four. Um, what job would you have had if you were not in the entertainment industry? I would probably have been some kind of designer, architect, uh, graphic designer, something to, something to do with art. Um, I really like photorealism at the moment. So um, my great friend, and I like photography as well, my great friend Michael Mobius um, has introduced me to a lot of people. There's a guy I really like at the moment called Mike Dargas who's a German uh, painter. He painted the honey-covered uh, models and, and so they're sort of yeah. huge, great thing. They're, they're amazing. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, like, I like some... Um, I, I like a bit of everything, you know. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to pick a favourite. But um, career-wise, I, I would never have been good enough with my hands in that way to have been any kind of painter. But, but I've always been very excited about designing things like my own kitchens and my own bathrooms and going and getting some graph paper even though i don't really know what i'm doing and measuring out everything to the millimeter and getting it all exactly right um and you know to the extent that i even if friends are saying i said oh, let me draw it let me draw it and i really i really enjoy doing things like that okay question number five this i got asked this recently by uh, a guy who is yeah he's very much into neurology and, and I had no idea how to answer this question. So this is question number five. Where is the rhythm and where does it come from? I have no idea how to answer that. <laughs> I was stumped. Yeah, where is the rhythm and where does it come from? Okay, well, I'll talk about something I did, if that, so it may, may be relevant, but, but I learned a lot doing a job that you asked me earlier about, you know, can you do your, I did, I did have a, a job offer, which became, you know, quite successful, which, which was a commercial for Honda cars. I don't know if you're familiar with it, where the I was remember a choir, it very well. choir singing the sounds of a car. So um, that was clearly a challenge. I got phoned up, said, do you think you can make a choir sound like a car? And I thought, well, I'll think about it. And, and uh, my ex-wife was a, a singer and had done some fairly physical theatre kind of thing. So, so I was aware of various things that you could do with the voice and the, the body. And of course, we're, we're all familiar with people that have done amazing, you know, beatboxing things even then and take six and groups like that, that, that you know, stir different emotions with voices. And so anyway, um, without doing a whole sort of thesis on, on this car ad, which I do do sometimes because people are interested in it. Um, I broke down the sounds of a car and everything it did into the things that make up the sound. Mm -hmm. So in a way, a technical makeup. And when I was doing it, I realized that pretty much everything has pitch and rhythm. So every time you sit around, you know, I mean, I'd be walking down the street, a bus would drive past and I'd sit down and write the bus down, which sounds ridiculous, but I think, what does that do? You know, and you go, do, 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 do. Okay, so that's, that's a, there's semi quavers, you know, or 16th notes if you're, if you're American and, 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 Every air conditioning, every piece of wind has a pitch. We can write ev everything, everything you can hear can almost be notated. Probably the answer is rhythm comes from, from everywhere. It's, 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 it's nature, it's, it's natural, it's in every sound, natural and man-made, whether it's birdsong, whether it's uh, uh, the internal combustion engine, whether it's an air, condition, air conditioning unit whirring, whether it's a, a, a washing machine, 
Um, I think of the sounds I can hear now, but you can almost hear a drone in every situation. Um, so I won't go on about sound, but sound obviously and bass and sub bass stir emotions and feelings. Of course. I think I think rhythm is very very similar. There's rhythm in in the in a you know I don't want to sound arty farty and pretentious, but you know in in a you know in a forest when the leaves are blowing, you know there there, there is there is there that is rhythm. That crackling everywhere. sound is a rhythm to yeah. that. And yeah, we were talking um talking to somebody yesterday about this, and and even just the a note where it is vibrating you know the distance between that is vibrating in a rhythm to create that pitch sure that frequency um and even even a heartbeat you know the thing that i find most interesting is when somebody utters the words i don't have rhythm you know i i, I don't have good rhythm well i i guess i guess that they may hear the rhythm but they may not be able to coordinate it i guess you know it's it's the same as you know talking about the art before me saying I couldn't be a good enough drawer. I'm okay with a ruler in my hand, but but to free form, you know, paint something, you know, we, we can all see it, but whether we can actually get our body to do it is probably a different matter. Yeah, it's the tricky. translation, isn't it? I guess the the, the the neurological to physical I don't know, I'm talking about stuff I don't really know about, right? It's, it's tricky, huh? Because like I, I, I've said this with everybody is that I I can play a groove or anything on a snare drum or a tom or whatever, um, but I can't dance. Like I literally cannot move my feet. I, I'm so uncoordinated when it yeah, comes that's, to dancing. That's just the physicality. I mean, I think musicians generally don't make great dancers. It, it would seem to me. I, I, we should stay on the stand. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you, mate. I'm I'm not a dancer. I love watching great dancers, and I don't I don't like making a spectacle of myself and and I'm not a bad dancer, therefore I don't enjoy dancing. It's always been one of my things, just you're at a party or something and someone says, come and dance. I go, you know what, I'm fine here, thanks. Yeah, me too. Go, and they'll say, come on, enjoy yourself. I go, well, I'm enjoying myself now. If yeah, I come I and dance, there. I will no longer be enjoying myself. Yeah. Uh, they go, oh, all right, miserable. I go, well, I'm not miserable, I'm, I'm happy. You're trying to make me miserable. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. you go and dance, I watch you, you dance, you're beautiful, you, you dance great, you know, like, great, fantastic, do that. And I'll sit here and I'll have a, I'll have a drink and watch you. Thanks very yeah. much. You know, but no, I'm with you, I'm, I'm not a dancer. And, uh, you know, I, I think one, one thing that comes from, from music, you know, is, and the way that professional musicians end up being professional musicians, is we're all perfectionists. You know, we, we all have to get things absolutely right, otherwise it doesn't work. So I've never liked doing anything that I'm not very good at. Like throw yourself into it, even if you're not very good at it. It's, it's, I've never been much one for that, you know. I, 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 I'll have a try at things, you know, especially if they're doing me or somebody else some good. Um, but generally, if I'm rubbish at it, I, I don't really want to do it, you know. I don't enjoy doing things badly. No, I, I, I would agree with you. Okay, question number six. So this might this is going to be a tricky one for you, I think. What is your career highlight, and what is it that made it so special? Winning a Grammy. Um, it wasn't the Grammy. It wasn't, you know, I'm not a hands in the air sort of. Yeah, look at me. Wow, 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 great. But I think, I think it came at a time in my life when when a, a lot of things had happened, you know, outside of music. And it was the culmination of, of a lot of hard work. And it was, it was for the cast album of Beautiful, the musical on Broadway. And the whole journey, you know, getting there, getting to that stage and, and doing what, what I felt was my best work and having a little pat on the back for it was very acceptable, you know. And, and, and you know, I'd lost both my parents fairly, um, you know, not that long before then. A lot of things had happened, and um, that that was the most that that was that was really special. Yeah, I can imagine, and also, you know, to do something on that scale, and then to you know to actually receive something like that for it is incredible. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it wasn't. I say, I don't want to say it was like getting the award. It wasn't getting the award. I've done if I'm explaining it very well. It, it's it was what it very, represents. It represents yeah. all the hard work. You know, and everything like that. You know, if I, you know, my mother was, you know, from the East End and, and she was very down to earth. And if I'd have walked home and said, Mom, I've just won a Grammy, she'd go, that's nice, dear. Have you made your bed? Yeah. You know, 
she she you know she wasn't like that kind of person which is which is fine and i've never been in my career you know and and, and um i do have a fairly stock answer to uh the question is you know which or what's the best thing you've ever done and and i always my stock answer would be the next one okay okay well, that makes sense. Okay, yeah. question number seven. This is, um, this can be for anything you want, basically. But what is your process that you have for preparing for a project, and like, where do you begin? Well, they're all so different. Um, uh, research is is very important. Um, you know, so the most recent big job I've done is I just did the BBC V Day celebration, seventy five years. Um, so I'm presented, this is the BBC and this was done under lockdown. It was on, on television last Friday and it's been really well received. Um, I'm, I'm glad to say. So I had, so, you know, so, so for instance, this job will have several challenges. The, the, I wasn't going to conduct cause it was a military band and, and I like, I think the military band should be conducted by someone in the military. So, mm -hmm. so, so that's one, one thing I have to learn. So I then go and research the band. You know, see how how they play. You know how good they are. You know what's their strengths, what their weaknesses. Because if I'm writing arrangements, I want them to sound good. So if I'm writing some you know ridiculous flute part, and the flute player is maybe you know not the strongest person because I, I don't know them. So so for that job, that would be part of the research is finding out who I'm writing for. Then likewise, I was given I think there's eight artists on this show. So uh, and they they all want to sing a certain thing, and this presented challenges because I wasn't going to get face to face to routine them so I tried to find you know some examples of them singing sometimes they actually sung that song work out the best key uh, work out a routine for them um, and, and that's research you know and in this day and age of course it's it's Google you know days gone by it would have been buying CDs and 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 even videos or you know going to the library um, but I do as much prep as I can and then if someone wants a an arrangement of a song I will you know probably listen to if it's a famous song, for instance, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, I'll probably check out a dozen arrangements and, and see, you know, to, to look for ideas, to look for inspiration. Um, in this case, the artist singing, singing that song, uh, Catherine Jenkins, she'd sung it several times and she's done it in some, some different ways. And I, you know, I, I didn't have the face-to-face -face time with her, so, so I worked out what would, what would work best for her. And then there's a, a general ensemble song and there's archive footage to be cut in from wartime singing and, and you know, I had to work out keys and some of the archive footage, I, I took away the vocal key because it was, you know, crowd singing in a really bad key so the men couldn't sing. So, so I pitch shifted things and, and tried to make the whole thing, thing work in that way. And, and then, of course, you've got to use click tracks because you're running VT. I hope this isn't boring for people that aren't interested in this. This is great. This but, is you know, so, so really it's a whole load of, a whole load of research, you know, and, and that's that job. I, I've, I'm just starting on another job, which is for, for actually, it's for four years time, believe it or not. It's the longest lead in I've ever had for a job. Wow. And it's to do with, um, it's, uh, you know, I'm not allowed to say, cause you have to, have to sign off things, but it's a, you know, it's a build from scratch kind of project. And, um, Again, they're looking for various things. Um, for instance, one thing is a uh, virtuoso piano piece. So I've been, I've spent, you know, I, I go out, I, I, I do long walks, you know, as, as my sort of exercise routine. So I, I, I load up a load of piano sonatas and concertos. I, I Google famous virtuoso piano pieces, look at a few famous piano pieces, I listen to the pieces, you know. So, so I always try and be diligent and, and, learn as much as I can, but, but preparation is, is really important, you know, really, really important for, for what I do. I can't turn up with a singer and she goes, Steve, this key is all wrong. You know, I mean, that's gonna, you know, that goes, goes bad. Result. Someone's coming to my studio. I want to know what kind of voice I have. Hopefully I'll get the mic right in the first place and the preamp and, um, you know, get the, if they like lemon and honey, you get lemon and honey tea. That's, you know, there, there's so many things to consider when you're embarking on the job from people's dietary requirement, requirements. You know, producing is a whole, whole other thing. I remember once reading William Orbit, someone said, how would you, what would you most liken your job to as, as a you know, famous record producer? I think he was working with Madonna at the time. And he said, uh, being an agony aunt. 
<laughs> so, so there's loads of aspects to, to the job, but, but yes, uh, I can't actually remember the question. I've been talking so much. Sorry, mate. It was about your process, but I think, I think we've got exactly what, what I asked. Yeah. It was perfect. Um, but I, I mean, it's, it is difficult because you have so many different types of gigs, you know, that, that you do that I guess you have to be flexible to a degree, you know, with certain things. But that basic level of preparation is kind of just so important for everything. Yeah. People often ask me um, as well, if they don't mind, they have an idea, do they mind if they send it to me? I, I, I always say absolutely send everything, you know, treat me like an idiot, send me as much information and then you can just discard the stuff you don't need. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm always happy to take on people's advice, opinions, etc. you know, because people have got ideas and, and, and obviously when you're in music and you're dealing with someone that maybe isn't in music to the same extent, they don't, vocalize their ideas very well you know they, they don't know you know they say they want jazz and you say well what do you mean by jazz what you mean small band big band trad band you mean 20s 30s 50s 70s you mean modern you want to improvise you want to, you know i mean that's that's a if i say it's jazz you know it's, that's a that's a huge scope of stuff to, to start with isn't it so sure. so that's just one sort of slight example of of what we what we have to do when we're preparing for a job yeah for sure i mean i i remember all those years ago when i first met you which was on daddy call i think it was yeah 2006 something like that yeah it was that show wasn't it yeah that was when we first met and i and i think you know i look back to then and, and how you put me in touch with ministry of sound and i did the booty love gig that's right. That was uh, yeah, yeah. I remember. I'm, I'm, I still know the girl. Yeah, you you put me forward for that and helped me with the preparation and showed me how to do those things. And those things have stuck with me to this day. That's right. That was about click tracks, wasn't it? Stuff I remember yeah. now. It was putting that whole Ministry of Sound band out that had never been out before live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four, with only a four piece, but making you know all the subs and the synths and the whooshes and the drops and everything work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was that was incredible. I I, uh, I will always remember that gig. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. Anyway, question number eight. What is the biggest obstacle you've ever had to overcome in your career, and how did you overcome it? Oh, biggest obstacle. Uh, I I don't think I can single out one, Ryan. I mean. There are always obstacles um, when you're trying to, trying to do something really well. It's usually people. Um, it would usually be a person. I mean, when you walk into your recording studio, it's very rare to go through a day without something not being quite right. You know, some piece of equipment will go wrong. It's probably often user error. It's probably because I'm not, not you know, I've not done something right or I've, I've done something wrong or I've pressed the button. Um, but sometimes it's hardware, sometimes it's software, but there's nearly always something wrong. What, you, what is difficult is, 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 is really, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to mention those, but I guess a few of the artists I've worked with have, can be temperamental. Um, I've got a lot of time for them, a lot of respect for them, because they're the people that, that are at the front. You know, they're the ones that have to, you know, they're ultimately the ones that are going to get the praise, but they're also going to get the criticism. So there's a couple, one in particular, I'm not going to mention a name. And, and you know, you turn up to work and they're obviously having a bad day and they just make making everybody's life difficult. You know, so those kind of things. So, so being, you know, like William Orbit said, being a bit of an agony aunt, you know, like, like getting through that day to try and make someone feel comfortable, happy with the project. You know, sometimes a lot of it will be about self-doubt mm -hmm. um, and not maybe liking my arrangement so i've done an arrangement for them so, and they say oh, i don't like it you know and, and and i'll have done it for a reason you know like not everyone has to like your work but it's also a bit late and really the, what you want to do is get a performance you're you know maybe in a studio with a big orchestra and and, and something has got to got to happen you know so so you know getting those people around to to giving a performance and being happy is is probably the big biggest obstacle i face you know and it's you know, in world terms, it's pretty minor, I guess. But, but I would say the biggest obstacle is, is people. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think that's the thing as well, because music is such an emotional thing and because singers 
you know, because they are at the front, they feel the pressure so much. Yeah. Um, generally, the fear that they have and the insecurities they have are generally put upon, you know, a producer or, you know, a pianist they're working with in close proximity because, yeah, that's where they offload. Yeah. I mean, a couple of times on big sessions, I've had client artists where I walk out and say, Steve, that's, that's not what I wanted, you know. And I... Um, I, you know, that, that will be a misinterpretation. It's not that I haven't listened and gone away and done my own thing. That will, that will, again, what we were talking about earlier, about people being able to explain what they want. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably good at that. So, but, you know, it, it, there's no point in saying, well, you said this, you said it. And the, you know, the difficulty then is that you've got a very expensive session going on and you've got to fix it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's happened. Um, I can remember one time it being like, I'm thinking, Jesus, how do I get out of this? Um, but that, that was only once. But loads of loads of little little things, and you know, people you know, not liking or wanting to change things. You know, that that that's a that's a regular obstacle. But you know, that's that's what we're there for. And I guess the day you really mess it up, you're not going to be asked back. So it's always worked out. Yeah, I agree. Okay, question number nine. Um, this is just a really random one. Um, you are hosting a dinner party for five people. Who would you invite? And who would get the last piece of pie? Oh. Well, I would invite my friends. Okay. Um, I'll invite those nearest and dearest to me. Are you asking like on a like professional level if I was doing a sort of fantasy music dinner or something? Do you know what? I think, I think a lot of people, especially now in this time that I've, I've done this with, they've all said friends. Friends yeah. and family. I'd invite my friends. Who would get the last piece of pie? Uh, oh, I think we'd share it. That's a good answer. Yeah, I think we'd share it because I think those people that mean so much to me would, uh, they wouldn't take it. They'd say, no, you're sharing it with me. So, yeah, I've, you know, I've, I've got a big birthday coming up next year. And, um, I'm I go I go to Mexico a lot you know I'm a keen keen fly fisherman you know and I go down there and I've got mates down there so you know if all of this kind of stuff is over we can still go I've invited I think it's 30 people to to my birthday party which is in a remote little village fishing village in the south of Mexico oh my god that's amazing so, so let's see who turns up <laughs> no pressure that's amazing Bye, you know, Oh, so let's see who let's see who can get there look i appreciate it's uh you know it's a long way and it's you know people might not be able to afford financially or or have the time but um you know it, I, I i think you know most of them will come i hope yeah I, and i i've i've i went to mexico for the first time last year loved it what an amazing place where did you go just into mexico city uh, that's um, amazing huh Oh God, we had the line bikes and just whoop, off we went, you know, it was incredible. You know, and we went out to this kind of, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but like an abandoned settlement sort of thing. And they had night projections, you know, proper touristy. We just went and did yeah. it. Yeah, I, I know. Well, that's way out of town, isn't it? That's, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, I don't know. Tech or something it's called. Yeah, uh, do you know what? I had five days there. That's one place I didn't go. So you just went to Mexico City, nowhere else? No, I haven't been anywhere else yet. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, I love Mexico. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would have my friends friends for dinner. Amazing. Well, it's funny because we now lead on perfectly to question ten, which is what's your favourite country or city, and what was it that first took you there? My favourite city is London, without a doubt. Okay. Um, I was born here. I, I fell out of love with it. I moved to LA for a while. Um, I like LA. I mean, I really like New York. Um, I, I like I like cities. I mean, they're just well, you know. I mean, to live London um, for a long weekend, Istanbul. Um, I love working in LA. Um, I I love working in New York. You know, it's it's but you know, I, I enjoy the culture of the European cities. You know, more than the American cities, you know, where you are, Amsterdam, Paris, Barcelona, 
you know, yeah, there's, there's too many to pick a favourite, but, you know, I guess I'm reasonably lucky as far as I could probably live where I wanted, and, and I choose London. I, like I think London has everything, you know, London has, you know, arguably the finest musicians all around in the world. Um, you know, it's, it's got everything, you know, I, I, I love my food as well. I mean, the food in London has, has caught up, with, you know, I think it took a while, but I think now it's, it's arguably one of the best places to eat in the world. Um, yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great having, having the whole of Europe on your doorstep. Um, yeah, culturally, um, yeah, I love Europe. It's, you know, for the things I mentioned earlier, for art, fashion, for music. Um, yeah, it's, it's really great. You know, like, you know, I like things American as well. I really like American authors. Um, I really like uh, the music that's come out of America. Obviously, you know, the jazz thing that I'm, I'm sort of so much a part of. For the, if you, I say jazz loosely, but that kind of jazzy commercial music and and um yeah there's a and i think you know america still in many ways is, is a land of opportunity you know i think there's a lot of great things going on there despite the president and um you know various various things but but uh yeah it's they've got they've got the space and hopefully again they'll have the money and and yeah let's let's hope great things come out of that that place, but for me, for me now, London is London is home and, and my favourite city. Amazing. Okay, question number eleven. So, I I hate the whole thing of what would you give advice to other people. Um, so, what advice would you give to your younger self, if you could? Um, practice, study harder. Um, I I would have liked to have looking back. I would certainly have worked harder at the piano. Um, it's the most complete instrument. It's not my instrument, but it gives you the basis for so much knowledge, harmonic, etc. And I kind of studied music to a higher level, um, classical music and history of music. Um, I think if I had my time again, I would have gone to university and done a degree rather than a, a performing university or college and, and studied the trumpet. So, um, yeah, I think I would have, would have liked to. Ed education is key. I, I wish I'd worked harder on, on you know other aspects of my education apart from playing the trumpet, which is kind of what I concentrated on then. Not did did me much harm, as the cliche saying goes. But I you know I wish I I wish I learned more about a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I I'm even very thankful that people forced me into learn theory. You know, I was I was kind of really encouraged and and almost forced to do my grade one to eight theory. Um, yeah. Even though I didn't, I was like, I'm a drummer. I don't need to know that. <laughs> Whereas sure. like, I'm very glad that I did. Now I'm it, very glad. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a, a good thing to know whatever instrument you play. And and uh, I'm one of those musicians that does believe the drums are a musical instrument. So there you go. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. <laughs> Not necessarily drummers though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay, yeah. and just the last question. It's not really a question, but what's next? What's happening with you? Like plans, ideas? Oh, it's ongoing. I'd like to get more into developing some young artists. I'm doing a couple of things with some singers. Um, I, you know, develop some songs, some arrangements. You know, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm not great at taking it to the sort of record company level where you then try and, you know, do the A and R bit. You know, that's not my thing, and and. And I sometimes get very weary of that quite quickly. Um, it's a process that has to be done. Um, and in these days of, we were talking right at the start of that instant, instant gratification and, and now, 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 of course, the X Factor generation, mm -hmm. you know, because you've enjoyed singing in the bath, you know, since you were three does not make you a trained singer. Um, and I think it's very difficult for some of the, the real talent out there that don't want to go on those shows to to compete with that kind of marketing i guess you know it's not my field of expertise but but anyway i'd like to to work with some artists develop some stuff um i'd like to write some of my own things you know luckily i continue to be busy you know working on musicals and and shows and a couple of albums for people um but i'd like to you know input more of what I know and do a few things, a few things my way. Um, it, it, 
you know, you, the trouble is when, when you get a young artist, you feel a certain responsibility that you've got to then try and help to shove them onto that level of where they have a career, whether it's fame, whether it's money, whether it's just, just simply earning a living, who knows? But, but you know, you don't feel a certain sense of responsibility. And, and I've not quite, you know, managed to sort of take someone on and work out the whole, the whole deal yet. Musically, I'm fine. It's the rest of it that I'm not so great with. It's, it's a minefield though, isn't it? Because, you know, it's, it's not just about the musical aspect, the songs, it's about your backstory. It's about um, how many followers well, you have uh, online and all these things, everything coming together yeah. as a package. That's, that's what it's become, hasn't it? You know, it's, uh, I mean, yes, certain of those programs, you know, well, I mean, oh, I've been involved with some and, and, you know, in America, you can have a program that's, that's kind of, has a musical integrity and, and then it seems to come here and unfortunately it seems to become like you say about the backstory and things that you know less about music which is you know difficult for me because I'm, a, I'm a, about the music really that's that's the thing that I, I will sort of always champion and try and be good at and I'm, I'm not so so expert at the rest of it and also I think you know being a musician you know you I, you know I need good a and I need good record company people to understand what what's out there and what the market comprises of, because really, most of us musicians aren't always that great at knowing what what people are going to want or like. You know, I mean, I, I haven't always been the best judge of that. You know, I've heard things. I thought, well, this is no one's going to like this, and everyone loves it. Yeah. I've heard things where well, everyone's going to love this, and no one else likes it apart from me. So I, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm still, I'm still trying to work that one out, Ryan. You know, it is, and it's. It's also everything changes so quickly and it's also about those trends and trying to keep up with those trends and what sounds are in and what sounds are not in. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's another aspect of it. Yeah. You know, I was, I was thinking of broad scale. Yeah. I mean, also like, to, you know, I, I've done a bit of writing. Um, I've written some scripts and a few things in my spare time. I'd like to, like to have more time to look at those. Um, you know, I've thought about doing a little bit of journalism, you know, maybe doing some radio myself, you know, I've got some ideas some programs and and try and you know maybe share some of what what i've learned and and you know some good some not so good i teach a bit now i teach at vienna oh, wow. at the, the school there which I, I enjoy doing um you know it feels like you're giving giving back a little and 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 also i, I find i learn a lot and it, it also keeps me up with the with the younger generation you know i, I it, it's good for me too I learn from them as much as they learn from me. Um, you know the way the way they th you know the way they think and and the way they do because of course it's different even from in, I, I don't know how old you are, mate. You're a lot younger than me, but five. You know, but you probably you know you were probably computer generation at school. See, I wasn't. There wasn't that when I when I started going. So. I was just. I think I first had my the first computer I had. I was about fourteen. I didn't have the internet till I was about fifteen, sixteen. I think. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I mean, so, so, yeah, I'm a lot older than you, and there was none of that, and, you know, I didn't even own computers until I was, what, 25, 26 or something, so, so, you know, we're, you know, musicians, people are growing up in a, in a, with a different outlook, a different, a different way of learning, a different way of finding things, you know, with access to everything, yeah. so, um, so it's it's good for me, you know. I know about that stuff now to a certain extent because I have to. Um, it's part of my my job, and, and I do do you know I program as well, of course, and, and use lots of different platforms. But the um, the way people learn and, and come to come to the university stage, having having done all that, is very different to what I did, if that makes any sense. So 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 the mindset is different, and and I have to learn to do that, and also. You know, a lot of my clients and, and people, if I'm doing something in advertising, I don't do so much anymore, but, you know, I'm working with much younger people. So, so I have to understand how they think. And, um, yeah, it's, it, like, like I said earlier, you know, the day I don't learn anything is the day I might as well pack it in. Yeah. Oh, good day, mate. Yeah. So, um, so have you met many musos? In, so interview over. Have you met many interviews in... Uh, uh, met many interviews? <laughs>